Welcome back to another awesome video. The TAC R555. Yeah, this deck was in great condition. It had one owner. I got this from the original owner, and it looks like it was shipped to TAC's headquarters, which, according to Google Maps, was still a TAC building until 2019 when it was put up for lease. Then it was shipped to a hi-fi store in Palatine, Illinois, which is no longer in existence, and it came my way via Meridian, Mississippi. It looks like it got the original box, original TAC tape. Look at this, we've got the instruction manual here. Okay. The styrofoam is still in the box. Yeah, good. And inside there's some safety instructions that look kind of funny. I'll make sure and not use this tape deck in the bathtub. How about you? <laughs> anyway, let's take a look at it. And you've been listening to it playing in the background, so we'll let it give you a little bit more of an audio sample for a few seconds. Do you know what auto reverse is? No. It's the ability to play music on both sides of a tape without physically removing it from the machine. Now on a record, music on two sides is an easier concept to see since you have to turn the record over to physically access music carved onto a different side. Flipping a tape actually just reorients the tape in the machine, so it reads a different set of tracks on the same physical side of the tape. So a side on a tape is a vertical distinction, unlike a side on a record, which is a horizontal distinction. In addition, flipping the tape also reverses the left-right position of the tape reels, which means each side of the cassette is recorded in a different direction. So, an auto-reverse cassette deck must be able to both play the tape forwards and backwards, as well as switch the tracks it reads. This is usually done with a head that has multiple sides or physically flipping the head as shown here. The cassette deck initiates the process once it detects the reels have stopped moving, or when the user presses reverse. In 1984, TAC made auto reverse even better by adding what they called real time reverse. This feature worked by detecting the leader tape at the start of a cassette. The leader is that little clear section that leads the magnetic part. By adding a special sensor and electronics to the mechanism, they were able to reverse precisely at the moment the recordable tape ended without waiting for the reel to stop turning. So you wouldn't be left with a gap of silence in your music. But how much time did this really save in practical terms? Let's compare and find out. This method is definitely a lot faster than the standard method, which lets the leader play out twice. But was it really worth it? This feature was not common at all. As a matter of fact, dealing with tapes and auto reverse was so much a part of the 80s cassette experience, the producers of Boogie Nights actually featured auto reverse prominently in a scene where they zoom into a Yamaha deck and the characters wait for the cassette to reverse before continuing the scene. But a big problem with real-time reverse was the fact that some tapes were not recorded all the way to the end on both sides, which meant there was a large gap of unrecorded silence anyway. Which is where another feature called Blank Scan came in. If you turned on Blank Scan, the deck would detect sections of silence longer than 10 seconds and fast forward past them. A couple of the other interesting quirks about this deck were the unusual implementations of record level control and music search. Most decks have level controls for each channel, left and right, or one record level and a record balance control. The R555 has two layers of levels, one preset dial for each channel's relative volume, plus a master slider level. In addition, music search, or intro scan, is in the forward direction only and one song at a time, and it must be toggled on and off. The display shows CPS1, which means Computronic Program Search. The one song limitation is probably only because the R555 is an entry-level machine. The circuitry is all there. It looks like they just left off a control button that lets you specify how many songs you need to skip. And now we're on to the repair section. If you're not interested, just skip ahead two to three minutes. When I got the deck, it was in great physical condition, but the electronics were not in good condition. As you can see, I've just got one flashing light, no response to buttons. 
And you can see there's no tape counter, no Dolby, no other indicator lights, which should be on, as I've seen in other YouTube videos. Some parts of it are getting power because of that flashing light, but some parts are not. A quick survey of the inside of the deck revealed two large circuit boards and a bunch of tie-wrapped wire bundles, as well as the usual melted belt problem. So I thought I would tackle that melted belt problem first because that's something I know how to fix pretty easily. Getting to the belts was kind of difficult. Uh, the whole front panel was held to the bottom with one screw, which I thought was not very well constructed. But in addition, all these wires were holding the panel on, so I had to loosen those wires a lot to be able to get a screwdriver in to get the cassette mechanism free. Once the cassette mechanism was free, it was pretty easy to remove a silver plate on the back and get to the flywheels. And as it turns out, there's only one belt in this machine, just the flywheels belt, nice metal flywheels, and uh, everything else is motor driven. So there's a separate motor for the reels and the flywheels. So it does have a lot of computerization and wires in here though it looks. It's a very, very heavily computerized mechanism, but looks to be pretty decent. I like the way they gave me a little plastic nub to hang the belt on on the left side there when I uh, was trying to get the top panel back on. It actually mentioned that in the service manual. So this was at least uh, designed to be worked on to some degree. Once the belts were replaced, I still had to deal with the electronic problem. On the bottom of this top board, I found a sign of a previous repair. It looked like somebody had tacked you know, a resistor or two and some capacitor and a transistor onto the bottom of the board. That wasn't a good sign. Uh, my level of electronic skills is pretty low, but I was able to ascertain from this block diagram that logically several different sections of the unit were supposed to be getting power from voltage regulators. So I sort of went to the power supply area and started just looking around for power. And I found a couple of interesting things. There were three identical power transistors. Two of them had 18 volts on them and one of them had almost no volts. So one thought was, hey, the power transistor is bad. So I replaced it, it was cheap, it was on eBay, the bottom was brown, I thought home run, but wrong. Eventually I realized something was pulling it down on the top board when I disconnected it, but I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I even got to the transistor, I wanted to figure out, could I apply power to a component? And I identified this component, this was made by Sharp, it's the level meter, and it has four wires. And I knew one was left channel, one was right channel, and one was uh, ground, and then through some continuity tested, I figured out which one was the positive. So I put 4.5 volts on it by attaching uh, uh, the ground to the chassis and then just attached a wire. And you may be able to see here, it did indeed activate the circuit and light up. You saw the LED come on, so it wasn't very bright. But what that told me was power was indeed the problem. And I was able to make it light up both attached to the existing connector and not. So there wasn't anything really grounding it out, or so I thought. Um, an even more obvious example, was this pilot light. If I grounded that and gave it three volts, the little front light light up. So I pretty much used some just logical testing like that to confirm power wasn't getting to the right place. Uh, because I, you know, I had a service manual that showed part numbers, but there was no indication of what voltages should be showing up at what test points and whatnot. The real breakthrough was when I started measuring voltage around this resistor. And on one side of the resistor, there was voltage. On the other, there was none, which led me to discover that these two capacitors had shorted to ground. So I replaced those capacitors and things got better. It actually got more voltage at all the places, but it wasn't enough. So at this point I was working with the top board disconnected, just trying to get the pilot light to come on or the Dolby light or something on the bottom board. So my next big discovery was two bad resistors. And these were one ohm resistors, these like green resistors. So I measured the voltage on one side of the resistor, which was coming right off the uh, rectifier diode thingy, and it was like 19 volts on one side and nothing on the other side, or, or like almost nothing. Yeah, three volts. So I was like, okay, a one ohm resistor shouldn't bring it down that much. So it turns out those two resistors were bad. And after I replaced those, success on the bottom board. I got the level meter to come on, the Dolby lights. We're getting power on all the circuits connected to the bottom board. When I plugged in the top board, it shorted out again, everything did. So I was like, wow. So I checked the top board and sure enough, there's another bad capacitor on the top board. After I replaced that, that was all the electronic problems. And after that, everything lit up and seemed to be working fine. I just had to put it back together. So in summary, what was wrong with this thing was two resistors and three capacitors. Not sure what happened, maybe a lightning strike or something. I don't know what took all this stuff out. But anyway, if you look at a good capacitor on my little continuity tester, what you'll see in one of the directions, it sort of slowly discharges, which is what a capacitor does. And on one of these bad capacitors, what I was seeing, they were shorted, so it would just peg the meter 
uh, in either polarity, I hooked it up, just pegged it all the way. What happened with the resistors is they dramatically increased resistance. So these, these are supposed to be a one ohm, that's one ohm resistor. And when I hooked those up and measured them, I'm getting like 32K or something on these resistors, which is weird. So yeah, there we go. Getting like 32K, that's 32,000 when it's supposed to be one. So if I take a one ohm resistor, hook it up to a real same color code, here I'm gonna get one, 1.1. 1 .1. So those resistors were just way out of spec. Not sure what happened to those things either. This is 1984, so I know it's an old deck, but you know, wow. Anyway, so yeah, that one's I think 300K. These resistors just went went out. So in in wrapping up this video, what's my conclusion? In terms of construction, this TIAC deck from the 80s is nowhere near the construction quality and reliability of this TIAC 4010S from the 60s. However, all that said, the cassette deck is still far superior to what you get in later in the 90s or early 2000s was when everything went plastic. If I had to sum up what this is, it's their attempt at adding personal computers all the rage in the 80s to a cassette deck. This is what you get. They tried some new things, and it's a decent deck. I would say it it colors and compresses the sound a little bit, uh, more so than I've noticed on other decks. I may put an audio sample in at the end, but it did not impress me in terms of reliability. And uh, I went to film this video, uh, this little closing scene here after I did everything else. I listened to it for several days. It worked fine, but then when I turned it on today, look, the counter has gone dead again. So I'm gonna have to get in there and figure out what's wrong. But anyway, that's about it. Thanks for watching us. That was the TIAC R555. See you next time for another awesome video.